Turn to 1 John and chapter 5. 1 John and chapter 5, it's page 2028. Page 2028. 1 John chapter 5, we began looking last week at the matter of things that we are commanded always to do, always to do, and um, I want to continue and look at one or two more this week, but First John chapter 5, reading from verse 2, says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. Mm. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. His commandments are not burdensome. Whatever God tells us to do, it might appear (coughs) difficult. But it's not burdensome. If it's the will of God for our lives, it is for our blessing. It is for our good. And when God says there are certain things that he wants us always to do, they might appear to be a challenge. They might appear to be beyond the horizon. I can never live like that. But be assured... If God commands it, it is not a burden. It is not a burden. And if God commands it, it is possible in Jesus. We can do all things through him who strengthens us. And so you may well have been challenged last week as we looked at always rejoicing. Always rejoicing. Rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. Always. Can we live like that? It's a challenge, isn't it? But dear friends, it's possible in Jesus. It is possible with God's enabling by the Holy Spirit to always live with joyful hearts, rejoicing in our salvation. To rejoice always is possible. To forgive Always is possible. It's not a burden, dear friends. It is a blessing to have a forbearing spirit, a forgiving heart, and to live at peace with all men as much as it is in our power, as much as it's down to us. Is it possible to always be of good courage, dear friends? We are commanded to be always of good courage. We're commanded never to be anxious. Is that possible? Can anybody live like that? Well, dear friends, yes. And it's not a burden. It's a blessing. Be of good courage. When? Always. Always be of good courage. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be dismayed. Never be anxious. Be anxious for nothing. nothing. Always be courageous. It is possible, dear friends, it's not a heavy burden that God lays upon us that is way beyond us. It is possible in Jesus. And we can do it. We can live that way. And God commands us to do so. Is it possible to always live in the fear of the Lord? Yes. Yes. And we should always live in the fear of the Lord. Is it possible to always set the Lord before us? To continually look unto Him? Is it possible? Is it possible to keep our eyes upon Him? Well, He commands us to do it always. It is possible, dear friends, by His grace and His enabling. 
It is possible to live in that constant awareness of the presence of God <clears throat> and to keep our eyes upon him. Is it possible, dear friends, to always pray and not to lose heart? Is it? Yes, it is, dear friends. It's not a burden that God lays upon us that we can't ever achieve. God's commandments are not burdensome. This is a way that we can live. It is the best way that we can live. God's design for our lives, God's purpose, God's will is perfect. Yeah. It's unbeatable. No one's going to come up with a better plan for your life than God's plan. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And God's commandments. And they're not a burden to us, dear friends. Mm -hmm. They're a blessing. They're a blessing for us. So they're the things that we looked at last week. Rejoice. Always. Forgive. Always. Always. Be of good courage. Always. <clears throat> Fear the Lord. Always. Set the Lord always before you, and always pray, and never lose heart. Turn please to Romans and chapter 8. I want to take up the next one. If we set the Lord always before us, if we live in that fear of God, that acknowledgement of Him, that awareness that He is constantly with us. Do you believe that He is with us? Yes. That He is Emmanuel, yes. God Amen. with Amen. us. That He's with us, lo, even to the end of the age. The age. Amen? Amen? I hope so. Do you believe that He's Lord yes. of your life? That he's the good shepherd who is watching over you. He's in full control of everything that happens to you. Amen? Amen. Romans 8 then. And verse 28. Says this. <clears throat> I'm sure we know the verse. We know. We know what? We know that God causes what? All things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Do we believe that? Yes. Yes. Amen. We do. When things are going well. <laughs> but what about when everything goes wrong? Do we still believe it? Yeah. And can we thank him for everything? Because that's our next one. In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Are we always thankful people, dear friends? We can only be thankful... If we believe Romans 8 and verse 28. That's the truth. We can only really be thankful in everything. If we believe what we have just read. That God is going to cause whatever it is that's happening to us. Whatever it is that we're going through. That God is going to cause it to work for good. Yes. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> A wonderful example of this is Joseph in the scriptures. So let's look briefly. Genesis chapter 50. <clears throat> Genesis and chapter 50. Here's a man, I don't know that he'd ever read Romans 8, 28, but he believed it. And he lived in the light of it. Genesis chapter 50 then, and I want to read verse 19. Joseph said to his brothers, 
Well, do not be afraid. Am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. good. In order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. <clears throat> what did this man go through? <laughs> he was sold and betrayed by his own brothers. Dear friends, you will be betrayed by even your own brethren. Jesus warned us of it. We looked at that recently. Are you still going to be able to give thanks? <coughs> he was despised and rejected. He's a major type of Jesus, isn't he? Yeah. Yes. Joseph's a major type of Jesus in the scriptures. Rejected by his brethren, Jesus was predominantly rejected by the Jewish people, wasn't he? Yes. Sold. Was Jesus sold? Yes. Betrayed and sold. Mm -hmm. Most Jewish people consider Jesus as a dead man. Joseph's brethren thought he was dead. And he didn't reappear until he was apparently lord over a Gentile kingdom. That's how the Jews see the church, dear friends. Mm -hmm. Lord of a Gentile thing. They didn't recognize him as their Messiah, as their Savior, the one that God had chosen to deliver them. And so it is. Joseph becomes a major type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph was forcibly removed from the promised land. Forcibly removed from the promised land. He lost everything, dear friends. Days are coming when it's quite possible that we will lose everything. Will we be able to joyfully receive the confiscation of our goods. Happily wave goodbye to all of it as it disappears from us because everything was taken away from Joseph. Everything. Even the things most dear to him. His wonderful robe from his father. What happened to it? His treasured possessions. Everything was taken away from him. He lost everything. He lived as a slave, sold as a slave. And then what? Things surely had to look up from there. No, <coughs> he was falsely accused. Falsely accused. Seen as a sex offender. I don't know what you think of the, as the lowest of the law, but... Joseph was convicted as a rap an attempted rapist, basically, mm -hmm. and cast into prison. Falsely accused, despised, rejected, sold, lost everything. Could anything get any worse? Yes. Well, it didn't end there, did it? <laughs> <laughs> Wrongly imprisoned, and even in prison, mistreated. And forgotten. But in all this and through all this, God was with him. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. What did he have to thank God for? God was with him, dear friends. God was with him. Turn to Psalm 105. <clears throat> A 
page 971, Psalm 105, I'll read from verse 16. God called for a famine upon the land. Mm. God called for a famine. God organized food shortages. Goodness me. Perish the thought. He broke the whole staff of bread. And he sent a man before them. Joseph. Sold as a slave. They afflicted his feet with fetters. He himself was laid in irons. Until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord did what? Tested him. Refined him, dear friends. What was God doing? How was God going to cause all of this to work for good for the, on the behalf of Joseph? What was God doing in this man's life? The word of God, dear friends, was refining him. Does God refine us? Yes. Yes. He's like a refiner's fire, like fuller's soap. He's going to do it with the Jewish people, dear friends. He's going to take them through the fire. But he does it in our lives. The testing of our faith, which is more precious than gold. Refined. God tests us, dear friends. God puts us through things. God ordains certain events in our lives. And what's it for? Our good. He's going to bring us through and refine us like gold is refined. He's going to give us a faith which is more suited for the days ahead. And he means it for good. Joseph was convinced that God meant everything that he was going through for good. Not only for his own good, but for the good of those around him. And so he was able to thank the Lord in everything. Give thanks. Dear friends, we need that same confidence. We need that same conviction. That God causes all things to work for good. And thank him for it. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And in everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Beg your pardon. Chapter 5, verse 18. Mm -hmm. Do not get drunk with wine, that is dissipation, but be being filled with Spirit. the Spirit. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, dear friends. Speaking to one another, admonishing one another, and in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with our heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks for all things. How can you always give thanks in all things? In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, even to the Father. Well, you can't, dear friends, and you never will unless you're fully convinced that God is going to cause all things to work for good. Joseph said, you meant all these things for evil. Mm. You sold me. 
You stripped me of everything. You wrote me off as dead. <coughs> you meant it all for evil. You rotten lot. <laughs> but God meant it for for good. For good. So even in prison, I never stopped thanking him. Even when I was wrongly accused and convicted. As an attempted rapist, thrown into prison, chained up, left with nothing. And even then when I got a glimmer of hope that I was going to get out when I helped those two fellas, they forgot all about me. But I was still thanking God because I was fully convinced that God meant everything for good. <clears throat> it's a challenge, isn't it? Yes, it is. But we'll never thank him for everything until we're fully convinced that he works everything for good. Lord, this seems like a disaster. This is so painful, but you can make it for good. And so I'm going to thank you, and I'm going to keep on thanking you, and I'm never going to stop thanking you. Amen? Amen. 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 Turn to Acts <clears throat> in chapter 24, and here's the next one. Acts 24. I read verse 14. Paul says, This I admit to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, mm -hmm. believing everything in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. If Jewish people believe everything, dear friends, that is written in the law and the prophets, where will it take them? It will take them to Jesus. Don't get involved, don't go along with anything that is calling Jewish people wonderful, godly people who believe the scriptures. If they believed Moses and the prophets, they would believe Jesus. It takes you there. It always does. It took Paul a while to get there, but it took him there. Because he believed the law and the prophets. It led him to Jesus. Jesus appeared to him. Having a hope in God which these men cherish themselves, that there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. In view of this, I also do my best to maintain, what? Always a blameless conscience, both before God and before men. What else should we always do, dear friends? We should always seek to maintain a blameless conscience. What does that mean? Well, God has given us a conscience. Yes. As dead unbelievers, enemies of God, our conscience is wrecked. Isn't it? Yeah. No awareness of sin, no great anything much. But we still have a conscience. When we're born again, when we're made new creatures, God revives that conscience. It comes alive. It's alive and kicking. The Holy Spirit within us does what? Convicts us. He ministers the Word of God to our hearts. You probably didn't think you were such a big sinner before you got saved but when God turns the light on dear friends 
rather than thinking we're perfect and all really, we, we become aware of how wretched we are. Isn't that what Paul said? Mm -hmm. Wretched man that I am. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I want to do this and I want to do that. And I, but I've got this thing in me called sin. And God switches the light on. And we become very aware of our own sinful natures. And that's still there. Sin is in you until the resurrection. Amen. No wonder we should be looking forward to it. As Wesley wrote, Till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin. No more. No more. What a day that will be. When I sin no more. And what a wonderful hope. Yeah. What a glorious thing to look forward to. One day I will be sinlessly perfected. Not just forgiven. Not just marvellously changed. Born again. Given a new nature. Helped to overcome sin. But one day I'll be completely free from it. Praise the Lord. Thank you. But in the meantime. It's still there. That old nature. But we have an ally. Our ally is our conscience. And it's alive and well when we're born again. And we need to look after it. What does it do? When we're going to stray, the Holy Spirit gives it a quick bash. And our conscience goes, whoa! Shouldn't be doing that. But we need to maintain it. We need to maintain it. We need to look after it, dear friends. Because it's going to be our greatest ally. With the Holy Spirit bringing conviction. And an awareness of what is pleasing to God. And what is not pleasing to God. And Paul says he always does what? He always seeks to keep a blameless conscience. We should always, dear friends, be looking to watch over our consciences. If our conscience has convicted us of something, if God has spoken to us, if God has said, no, you shouldn't be doing that, or you should be doing that, What should we do? We should listen to it, dear friends. We should listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit stirring our consciences. Maintain a blameless conscience. How do we do that? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy and chapter 1. Verse 5 says this, The goal of our instruction is love. From a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. What's a good conscience? It's one that's not saying anything to you. It's not ringing any alarm bells. It's not telling you you've got things to sort out in your life that God's not happy about. It's a good conscience. It's behaving itself. It's doing all right. It's it's quiet. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 2, warning of those who depart, and it says in verse 2, by means of hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. We should maintain a good conscience, we should keep. A good conscience, a blameless conscience. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Mm -hmm. 
If God says, stop that, stop it. If God says, do that, do it. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Because what happens if you do? You start to kill a whole area of your conscience. How can you get professing Christians who will openly stand up and say, well, God's not convicted me about living in sin. God's not telling me I shouldn't be fornicating. God's not telling me whatever. How can somebody get to that point? Surely they're lying. No. God's not telling them at all. He's given up. God did tell them. Well, God said a little bit of pornography is okay. God's not convicting me about it. Well, no, probably not anymore. But he did the first time, didn't he? You knew it was wrong. You heard his voice, but you hardened your heart. Mm. And you went on. And now what have you done to that part of your conscience? You've seared it, as with a branding iron. You can do that with parts of your body, can't mm. you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You take a branding iron, you sear them, you literally kill all the nerves. Yeah. If somebody sticks a pin in you, and you say, I can't feel a thing. Now somebody who doesn't know what's happened will say, he's lying. Of course he can feel it. Someone's just stuck a pin in him. But now they're telling the truth. They don't feel a thing. Because that part of their body is seared. Well, dear friends, we can do that with our consciences. We can sear a whole area of our conscience. And you can get professing Christians saying, God's not telling me it's wrong. Well, no, he won't. He tried to, and he wouldn't listen to it. And you just went on in your sin, and now I absolutely 100% believe you. God is not telling you that it's wrong, because you have seared your conscience. We need to always maintain a blameless conscience, dear friends. <clears throat> Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And your conscience can be different to another believer in Christ. Mm -hmm. Let me explain that strange statement. Now, when I got saved, because <clears throat> of the life that I'd lived, very early on in my Christian life, I decided that I was going to be teetotal. I wanted to be able to say to people, I don't drink. I don't need it. I haven't touched a drop for 35 whatever years. If I did, my conscience would bother me greatly. Why? Because between me and God, I've said, Lord, I'm finished with that, for you. I want to do it for you. I want to do it so that when I witness to people with a drink problem, I can say, I have a drink problem and I have not touched a drop for 35 years. And if I did, my conscience would bother me. But another believer might have a glass of wine with a, with a meal and their conscience doesn't bother them one iota. Do you understand? Mm. But for me, my conscience would bother me greatly. I didn't make a vow as such, but you, you get the point. When we've had dealings with the Lord over something and we've said, right, that's it, it's gone, it's finished, that's out of my life. I want to do that for you. 
Whether I need to or not is another matter, but I'm going to. And if I get involved in that, my conscience is going to bother me. So maintain a blameless conscience always. It's one of our greatest allies. It's what the Holy Spirit pierces. Amen. Amen. One last thing then. First Peter chapter 3. What else should we always do? There's one more always which I'm not going to touch on. I might do it as a separate subject sometime. We're instructed to always carry about the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus might be manifest in us. But I think perhaps that would take a full sermon. So. But be aware, you should always do it. First Peter chapter 3 then. And verse 13. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. And do not fear their intimidation. Do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Where should Jesus sit in your heart? On the throne. Amen. Amen. He should be first in everything. He should be preeminent in everything. God, God has put his son to be first place, preeminent in everything. If you want the Lord in your life, where should he be? First in everything. First in everything. So sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always what? Always ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence, and keep a good conscience. In case you've forgotten my last point. <laughs> what should we always do, dear friends? We should always have on our shoes. Don't take your shoes off, dear friends. You know your socks smell. <laughs> Don't take your shoes off. Always be ready to do what? Give an account. God has given you a testimony. And this is particularly important for us in these days. Because the gospel of the kingdom must be proclaimed to everyone. Who's going to do it? And then the end shall come. God wants everybody to hear in this dark, hopeless world that there is one hope. And what is that hope, dear friends? The hope is Jesus. The hope is the resurrection. Is there any other hope in this world? No. In these days? No. And anyone who doesn't know Jesus is without God and without hope in this world. And you have a hope. If you are born again, you are born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's the first fruits. He's the forerunner. Where he's gone, we shall be looking forward to going. What's happened to him is going to happen to us. We follow him. And we have a glorious hope. Christ in us, the hope of glory. We've got a hope, dear friends. And we should always be ready to give an account for the hope. Now this world has no hope, dear friends. What hope is there for this world? It's going from bad 
to worse and from worse to worse still. It's going to the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's going to the days of Noah. Lawlessness will increase. Earthquakes will increase. Famines will increase. Wars and rumors of wars will increase. Lawlessness will increase. It is getting darker and darker by the day. There is no hope for this world. It is destined for wrath. The judgment of God are coming thick and fast. And they're coming soon. What is the only hope, dear friends? In labor pains, what is the only hope? The only hope is if you're looking forward to the baby. And dear friends, that is all God expects of you. But he expects it always. He expects you to relate that message to a hopeless world. People all around you who have no hope. They're in darkness and you have a living hope. And you need to relate that simple message. These are birth pangs. These are troubled times. It's going from bad to worse, from worse to worse still. And the only thing that there is to look forward to is Jesus. And if you're not looking forward to Jesus, you have nothing. You are without God. You are without hope. You're in darkness. And you are destined for wrath. Share that one with you, friends. Neighbors, everybody, always. <clears throat> Let's look at one or two more scriptures. Ephesians 6 and verse 15. It has never been easier to share that message, dear friends. Never. And as the days go by, it will get even easier. As things get more and more dark, more and more lawless, People are beginning to see there's something very strange happening in the world today. And we've got the answer. We're walking in the light. The law of the Lord gives us our illumination. Thy word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. We're not in darkness that the day should overtake us like a thief. We're sons of light. We're the only ones who understand these things, understand the days. Even people who are, uh, you know, conspiracy theorists who see that the, there's something very dark and strange going on. They're not in the light because they can only see as far as men. They don't see that there are principalities and powers, that there's antichrist spirit controlling these people. They don't see a spiritual side to any of it. But you do, don't you? Yes. Ephesians 6, verse 15. Having shod your feet with what? The readiness, the preparation of the gospel of peace. You've just got to be ready, always. That's it. That's the command. Always be ready to give an account. Always. Be fishing. Get out there. Throw some ground bait. Get yourself a nice big scripture. Post it up somewhere. In the back of your vehicle or something. And if there's hungry fish, dear friends, they'll start biting. Yes. That's the principle of fishing. Anybody been fishing? Have you got any fishermen? I used to hate fishing. I don't know why I ever went. Never caught anything much. But you, you, get, you take this stuff, you, they call it ground bait, and I can't remember what was in it, the load of flour or something, I don't know. Anyway, you throw great big clumps of the stuff in the water, and it gets the fish biting. And then, of course, they're going to bite on your little maggot dangling off the end of your hook and you're going to pull it out because you've got it biting. Well, we can throw our ground bait all the time. You don't know where the hungry fish are, but God does. He alone sees the hearts of men, dear friends. 
but they're out there still. So have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Get your gospel sandals on and don't take them off. Always be ready. Always be ready to give an account. Be ready, be looking and be willing. Romans chapter 10 and verse 11 says, The scripture says whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Are you going to be disappointed, dear friends? I love that word. I don't know how accurate the, <clears throat> the translation it is. I am not going to be disappointed. I've got a pretty exciting hope. I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about what it's going to be like and everything. I like to stir up my hope. And I'm looking forward to it. I've got a pretty good picture of a golden city with rainbows everywhere and all this kind of stuff. I, I spend a bit of time thinking on these things. God's designed my mansion beautifully. Beautifully. Everything I could have hoped for. And I'm not going to be disappointed. It's going to be abundantly beyond what I ever think or imagine. Of that, I am sure. You'll not be disappointed, dear friends. You'll not be disappointed for believing the Word of God. Let people mock you. Let people call your names. Let people, even so-called believers, ridicule you for taking it literally. You will not be disappointed for believing God. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all. Abounding in riches for all who call upon him. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they're sent? Mm. Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. We are not all called to be evangelists. We might not all be called and equipped to go and stand up and preach on the streets, but we are all commanded to be always ready to give an account. One to one, to share your testimony with those around you, to tell them what is different about you, why you're not so depressed about what, everything that's happening, because you have a glorious hope. Jesus is coming in. Your eyes are lifted up. Your redemption draws nigh. We're looking forward to the baby. So the birth pangs don't hurt. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just do want to thank you again for a glorious hope in Jesus. And Lord, we would ask that you'll help us to always live the way that you want us to live. To be always thanking you. To be always looking to you. To be always rejoicing and praising you. And Lord, committing everything to you in prayer. And always ready to give an account for the hope that we have in Jesus. Lord, help us to live that way. It's not beyond doing. It's not a burdensome charge. So help us, Lord, to live in the wonder of it and the glory of it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.